on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I'm working with people who share all kinds of scary stuff they've been suffering from, and it turns out that Oxalate is the major player behind a lot of it. If I was to go out and forage up a bunch of stuff and we brought it to the lab, I think the Oxalate content would be off the charts. And these are foods that have traditional use amongst the indigenous people of our region. Unfortunately, a lot of modern people have a lot of leaky gut, and instead of absorbing, say, 10% of the oxalic acid in that food, you could absorb 60 or 70 percent. Calcium oxalate bonds to this oxalic acid. It can precipitate out of the blood as crystals that can aggregate in your kidneys, right, and become kidney stones. Dark chocolate, terrible form of oxalate. No! So the darker the chocolate, the more oxalates. I'm really prone to connective tissue injuries. And so I'm starting to wonder, this self-inflicted with oxalates. We have to stop ignoring the toxicity of oxalate and stop using any argument to justify eating high oxalate foods. Episode 142 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Are Oxalates Destroying Your Health with Sally Norton, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. You've got to try the new naturally flavored colostrum from Sir Thrival. Chocolate with real cacao, vanilla with real vanilla extract, strawberry with real strawberry juice. I've been using colostrum daily and promoting it as a powerful nutritional supplement for over 15 years. In fact, I just had a quarter cup in my blended drink this morning and again this afternoon. With its ability to fortify your immune system, nourish and rebuild your gut lining, repair injuries, aid in muscle growth and recovery, and so much more, I think it's one of the most sophisticated food-based supplements we can include in our diet. Sir Thrival is already known as the number one source for premium colostrum, and now they've just released three new formulas, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. They're lightly sweetened with monk fruit and combined with MCT oil to make them more soluble in water and in blended drinks, all while having the same potency as Sir Thrival's original colostrum. They're so good, I keep eating them by the spoonful right out of the tub. Eaten like that, they're like a powdered ice cream, but of course, they make excellent blended drinks too. Again, these aren't those over-the-top fake flavors you taste in so many supplements today. These are flavored with real cacao, vanilla, and strawberry, so they taste great and really clean too. Go to surthrival.com to see the entire lineup of health-promoting supplements and superfoods and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? Hey, are you a small business owner in the wild food space or a hobbyist forager looking for a side hustle? Then listen up. This episode is brought to you by Foraged.Market, a website for buyers and sellers of wild and specialty foods from around the globe. Think Etsy, but for foods with a story. But it gets better. Not only do you get your own product page to promote your goods, they expose you to a constant stream of ideal buyers, foodies, chefs, and restaurants looking for raw ingredients or value-added products just like yours. Go over to foraged.market slash wildfed to get started. While you're there, you'll also find a coupon for $10 off your first order of any of the incredible products there from other sellers. Foraged.market. Buy there, sell there, and learn more about their incredible vision and conservation ethic by listening to episode 122 of the Wild Fed podcast. Foraged.market, the global marketplace for wild and specialty foods. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to the Wild Fed podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed, food is all around you. Today's show is a bit of a departure from our typical conversation here on the podcast, but it's one I've been wanting to have for quite some time. My guest is Sally Norton, and she's become really well known for talks she's given on oxalic acid and oxalates, compounds and even crystalline structures frequently found in plants and often present in some of our most cherished wild plants and commercially available superfoods. I've been aware of oxalates and oxalic acid for a long time since it's present in plants like sheep and wood sorrel, sour plants that are often some of the first that new foragers learn. But I've also experienced the damage that oxalate crystal macrostructures can do when they're present in plants like jack in the pulpit, which burn the delicate mucous membranes of your mouth and throat if you're daring enough to try ingesting them. But I was surprised when I started hearing from some folks, usually those associated with the ancestral health community, and in particular the carnivore diet proponents, that oxalates might be a hidden culprit undermining human health in many profound ways. 
Now, to be fair, we've seen this kind of thing before. Compounds in foods, and by that I mean compounds that have always been in our foods, like cholesterol, for example, or saturated fat, being touted as incredibly dangerous for your health in one decade, only to see a reversal where they're considered healthy in the next. So when I first heard about the supposed dangers of oxalates, I was pretty dismissive since these compounds and associated structures are common and were most certainly part of our diet for a very, very long time, being present in traditional and wild foods. Add to that the way carnivore diet proponents sometimes cherry-pick data to confirm their pre-existing biases against plants, the very same way that vegans do about animal foods, and let's just say I was skeptical. But in the spirit of keeping an open mind and because I knew that oxalates can be damaging and dangerous in strong concentrations, I thought I'd give this idea its day and hear the argument. I present it here today not as an endorsement of the idea, but rather to let you hear it if you haven't already. As a plant eater and forager, I remain a skeptic, but I'm going to sit with it for a while. If it is in fact true, it would mean, for me at least, a bit of a dietary redesign would be necessary. One thing we have to be constantly vigilant about, though, is the way that fads, like fashion, roll through the dietary world. If we were swayed by every new diet, superfood, healing compound, or recently discovered to be bad for you substance, we'd be eating a very fickle diet indeed. And it turns out, we have, in fact, been doing just that. In my own lifetime, I've been witness to fat-free, high-fat, high-carb, low-carb, vegetarian, vegan, paleo, keto, carnivore, and many, many more, just like you have. I've seen foods like cacao vilified only later to become a superfood. I've seen alcohol medically demonized and later recommended. I've seen meat go from something you should eat to something you should never eat to something you should seldom eat to something you should only eat. One thing is certain, modern humans can't figure out remember might be a better word, what we should eat. So perhaps we should take all of this dietary advice with a grain of salt. Unless, of course, salt has fallen out of fashion. Then just skip the salt, I guess. I don't know. Since we're all suffering from an incredible and unprecedented bioaccumulative burden of novel industrial chemicals and circadian rhythm disrupting technologies, life sapping sedentism and a lack of exposure to the natural elements that cause health, like sufficient sunlight, fresh air and time spent moving in the outdoors, it stands to reason we'd have some novel health issues too. The danger is pinning all of those novel health issues on some new boogeyman, especially when the villain is a constantly changing switch suite of characters, each one responsible for all the ills of the world when it gets its 60 seconds of fame. So, as you can hear, when a new dietary villain is raised up for the masses to fear and loathe, and the profiteers to start rolling out endless new packaged products made without it, I become slow to jump on board. That said, sometimes the health turnarounds you see in others leave you wondering. Maybe it's not that a given food or substance is impacting everyone, but rather, maybe it's affecting some, as with gluten or casein. And that seems to be the case with oxalates. There are those that begin restricting them only to experience remarkable health improvements, to include the resolving of long-standing, previously misunderstood health conditions. Some folks claim to have had remarkable health turnarounds when they reduced their oxalate intake. It remains, at this point, pretty anecdotal, but it's on my radar. And again, I share this interview with you to add something to the conversation, not as an endorsement of the theory, but as something worth looking at. Who knows, maybe in a decade it'll be common household knowledge, with oxalate content being, as Sally hopes, labeled on packaged foods. Or maybe like saturated fats, something we've always eaten, but by the 80s we were blaming for heart disease and heart attacks, only to reverse course a few decades later, we'll decide that no, oxalates are not the culprit we thought they were. Whatever the case, oxalates are real and they probably deserve our attention. Whether we should be cutting them out of our diet to the extent that we can is up to you. Whatever the case, it's a fun interview and I learned a lot. It certainly has me reassessing the chia seeds, cacao nibs, and nut butter in my smoothie each day. That said, I drank one this morning. So the verdict, I'm afraid, is still out on this one. Sally Norton, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. What a fun idea. <laughs> I've been trying to get you on. This has been kind of a long time in the making. I've been trying to get you on here for a while. Um, I get a lot of questions about your work. So um, maybe we could start off. You could just tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, and uh, in particular, your area of focus, which is just this like fascinating niche that I don't hear too much about from other folks. Fascinating niche. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I couldn't agree more that it, it is fascinating to be thinking about oxalate and how it is secretly messing with our health and how we in modern times are way over consuming it and uh, are out to lunch and really not paying attention to this. And it can trap some of us into a horrible pit of unexplained suffering. And that's where I ended up. But it started a long time ago for me where I was already as a 12 year old starting to get arthritic problems. I would wake up with back pain. I was starting to have cognitive focus trouble, especially in high school, struggled with uh, studying. And it's not because I didn't want to study. I am a bit of a library geek. (laughs) (laughs) And I decided in seventh grade that I wanted to get into what I now would call health promotion. Uh, Back then, I was thinking, well, if, if food is such a big influence on disease like heart disease and cancer, wouldn't we all want to know how to select food so w- that we're productive and happy and we don't go to the hospital with heart pain <laughs> and cancer right. for we don't need chemo, like a life without chemo. What a great idea. Mm-hmm. You know, so that I decided when I was 12 that I would study nutrition. And by the time I was in 10th grade, I knew Cornell down the street was the place to go for me. And um, so it wasn't that I didn't want to study. I just really had trouble focusing. And uh, in retrospect, I can see that oxalates were affecting my life as a young child and have my entire life. And I didn't get a full picture of that until a fairly simple but consistent serious change in my diet brought back to life parts of my body that hadn't worked in 30 years or more. Can I jump in there for a second? So at that time, and, uh, you know, I picture back to my childhood. Um, I, I got into nutrition about age 16. I'm 43 right now. So, um, when I was first getting into it, you know, the, the it'd be hard for like a young person today to imagine the food desert of, you know, that era. And uh, <laughs> in particular, like this idea, you know, I think people have been very spoiled by the existence of like whole foods, for instance, where, It's just you walk into this oasis of products where, you know, you could never, you could spend all day there and not see them all. Um, I mean, I remember health food stores that were like the size of a closet. And I always joke, you know, what they sold. smelled funny. Smelled really distinctive, right? And (laughs) it was like textured soy protein. It was date chunks rolled in oat flour, um, maybe some barley or something. You know, it was like very minimal options. At that time, when you started to make changes, I can't imagine you were aware of the issue with oxalates. So did you sort of stumble into a diet that started to help you? Um, or were you were you thinking about this issue at that time? Because also the while the principles that create health, I think you and I probably both agree, are ancestral and therefore don't necessarily need to be, you know, written down in current literature for us to uncover them. Um, it was challenging back then. There was a lot less access to information. There was a lot less information. So uh, how did that all kind of play out for you? Okay, you're mentioning lots of back thens, and I think is it the back then when you were 16, or the back then before we had the written word? <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, yeah, not before the not before the written word. So not six thousand years back. No, I mean, uh, you know, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, the the idea right. of good eating in the U.S. just had a very different connotation, and I and I think one of the things I've seen in your work is that a lot of these changes that appear positive to the average consumer might not be. So that's something we can talk about later. But but were you aware that oxalates were an underlying issue for you at the time? Or did you kind of stumble into that following what was at the time kind of, you know, healthy eating pr- principles? No, I had a mind blowing revelation when I was 49, about to turn 50, that just blew the gray matter to shreds in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, Cornell, you know, we uh, learn that oxalates are in plant foods and there's three sentences in one chapter and two in another chapter. And it says, you know, if you eat oxalates in, in a meal, it will chelate with calcium, iron, and so on and reduce your ability to get them out of the food and into your blood. And so, yeah, it's just like tea and tannins and other things that grab minerals. Oxalate's another one of those. And by the way, it causes kidney stones. And, you know, people with severe repeated kidney stones should be on a low oxalate diet. End of story. That's all I knew about oxalates. And um, I 
thanks to my husband and Google. I mean, right now we're in this beautiful time where information is shareable and fairly findable. The main blockage to getting information is our own cognitive biases Mm -hmm. and our wishing for confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And once we see something that we already agree with, we know that's got to be right. (laughs) That's got to be it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So... I was just like floored when my husband used Google and he found the Volvar Pain Foundation, which is based in North Carolina, like 40 minutes from where I lived for 15 years and where I worked at the university medical school and put on a holistic conference in 2005 that was, I was, since I was designing the content, it was an integrated medicine conference. I was focusing a lot on toxicity and the various diseases that toxicity promotes in the whole structure of that conference. And I would have involved the Volver Pain Foundation had I know anything like what I know now. And what they're saying that pelvic pain, including vulvodynia, which is a brutal pain situation of the female crotch, but also affects men, uh, can be addressed with a low oxalate diet. Oh, interesting. That was weird for me to learn that in 2013. Well, actually, it was 2009 when I when I had my own attack of crotch pain and my husband looked it up because I was like having an outburst, like, this is not tolerable. I cannot live like this. And of all of our pen, oh my gosh, you know, like oxalates cause crotch pain. Okay. Uh, that's weird. I'll buy your stuff and see what I can learn because I'm a perpetual learner. You have to be if you're trying to figure out human health because human beings right now are stuck in a world where most people are suffering from something and often doing it in silence. Like you don't talk about crotch pain in public. You don't talk about... (laughs) I'm impressed (laughs) you're doing it right now. (laughs) It's really not... Yeah, like this is in desperation mode. Like I need people to be honest about what's really going on. And a lot of us have incontinence and diarrhea and constipation and all kinds of things that are not polite conversation. Uh, and I'm from a polite conversation kind of world and era. Like, you know, you wear an IZOD shirt and you look good on the surface and you you talk about the weather. You certainly don't talk about your aches and pains, especially if they involve genitalia. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> uh, I'm working with people who share all kinds of scary stuff they've been suffering from. And it turns out that Oxalate is the major player behind a lot of it. And all of this is news to me. And it, I was so... Um, under understanding this when I was first learning in 2009, you know, I have um, an edible landscape or I had at the time, I set up my yard to be an edible landscape and was growing organic sweet potatoes and figs. And these are both high oxalate foods, all my herbs and various, you know, whatever you can get to grow for food. I even had sorrel growing in my yard, which is a classic. Ooh, high the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> sorrel, sheep sorrel or, or wood sorrel? Um, I th- it's sheep sorrel. Yeah. And, you know, the sorrel is a confusing word because it's really just the term for sour leaf. Mm-hmm. Um, but the original sorrel is, a, is coming from oxalis. That's the the term that was used to name the compound oxalate, oxalic plants, oxalis is the plant and the compound is called oxalic acid, named after oxalis, which is kind of like the shamrock plant that you might buy in the grocery store in, yep. in March. Yep. That That's a oxalis. So um, rabbits seem to love that stuff, even though it's really high in oxalate <laughs> and oxalic acid. But you can squeeze the juice out of that stuff and start using it as an industrial chemical, which we did in the 1700s. It's a mordant or a fixative in doing a dyeing of calicos and cottons. It's used to prepare wool for dyeing and other textiles. It's used in industry for all kinds of purposes, like cleaning engines. You can get the rust out of old engines and or anything else um, using the juice of sorrel and spinach and plants that make a lot of oxalic acid. So this is a really crooked answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to set the stage a little bit too. When I think about oxalic acid, one of the ways I describe it to folks or to oxalates to folks, because spinach is such a great example because anyone who's eaten it, even cooked, 
but particularly when it's raw, you get that sensation of the porousness in your teeth afterward. And uh, if I understand it right, you know, the, the calcium of your teeth is bonding to the oxalic acid and, and creating calcium oxalate. And you feel that in your teeth afterward. I mean, there's enough of it there to chemically react with your, with the appetite of your teeth. Um, is that, is that right in saying or, or well, close? spinach definitely gives you a bizarre mouthfeel and some people feel heavy coating in their mouth and so on. And oxalic acid is used in coating monuments in order to protect them from acid rain. Now, oxalic acid is one of the acids in the rain. This is very, there's so much irony in oxalate. Mm. And so it actually, oxalate in the mouth can become a protective coating on teeth to prevent further erosion from acids in the mouth. It's probably the only beneficial use of oxalic acid, and it ends up being tartar. So a huge amount of tartar is, is coming from oxalic acid, which is not well cataloged in the medical literature and not well understood in dentistry. Um, but there's something with like protective coating. So in, in, today we believe in hygiene and clean teeth, but before we had severe education about dental hygiene, native peoples often didn't bother with daily brushing and things like that. Although there's ways to do that. Um, and, without and, shock, and as you know, shockingly to the the average person today, they had better teeth than us in many cases. I think we've been a little confused because we see um, a lot of folks see people today in the developing world and they don't realize, and they'll see missing teeth and, and really bad uh, dentition. Mm. And they don't understand that right. you're seeing people who've been pushed off their lands and pushed off their native diets. And they're eating a like a highly demineralized, you know, allotment of Western foods. And then, then they suffer from those things. And then we look at them and think, oh, wow, it must've been so bad before people started living <laughs> the modern lifestyle. So, you know, that's, I think right. a, a bias that we just don't even understand we have culturally. Well, in the whole sedentary style of you live in this, you live in this boundary, you have this city boundary or this property boundary, and you have to live in this one place year round. That's totally un unreasonable and not natural approach to living. And certainly in very impoverished areas like Africa, people are forced to live on cassava root and other very toxic plants as a staple and get less and less variety. And they have severe malnutrition from, you know, in access to milk and herding and blood and animal foods in addition to a, a more diverse set of plants that might be more seasonal. Um, so there's, you know, malnutrition is really interesting problem that isn't still isn't well understood and took a long time to recognize that we needed lots of micro minerals and these little things called vitamins, <laughs> vitamins, and now we call them, you know, like that was a whole pretty recent innovation to even recognize that. And then, but in the meantime, we've created a lot of social political structures that have, have people scraping by on um, inadequate resources. Yeah. For a long time, the word nutrient just kind of referred to macronutrients, right? People just thought, oh, you just need your fats and your carbohydrates and, and your protein. And then it's like, oh, wait, there's, you know, minerals. And then, oh, wait, there's vitamins. And now it's like, oh, wait, there's, you know, phytonutrients and oh wait there's and we just keep like uncovering layers and layers and layers and it reveals that we've uh stepped away from a lot of things that before we understood what how important they were <laughs> so many of the things right. we used to do and there's a lot of room for mistakes and all of that and biases and all of that and today we get ideas and we cling tight to them and we sometimes can't update our thinking as quickly as the the actual knowledge is advancing are we get stuck on certain notions and hang on to them. So it's true that nutrition started with, oh, well, you need energy and energy needs to have, you have to have a certain amount of protein. And nutrition started off really with like counting how much energy of the three macronutrients that provide the energy, the fats, the carbs, and the proteins. How can you get away with like the cheapest diet? That was really where nutrition mm -hmm. started is how do we measure these macronutrients? And then what's the minimum protein we need and how can we reduce our 
expense in food so that poor people can stay poor and be given an inadequate wage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, the East India Trading Company's got big business to do, okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, an interesting promoting foods for their health and their being a health elixir is a really old school way to do to sort of do snake oil sales that the uh Chinese learned this early with tea as the Western explorers came in and discovered tea in China and the Dutch exporters started bringing tea to England and Europe and so on. They, right from the beginning, they're like, oh, this stuff's going to be expensive, guys, because it's got all these special powers. Because, of course, the caffeine is such a lovely thing, right? <laughs> People go for caffeine like they go for sugar. And so you could be convinced, you know, you could sell your product, upsell your product early on in like the, what, 600 years ago or whenever this was going on, 400 years ago. I've been looking um, for a good source of snake oil for a while. <laughs> from, yeah. from what I understand, snake oil is really high in EPA. So I've, I've, I've considered being a snake oil salesman. I, I feel like this is a great food product, but, but sorry, carry on. Well, sadly, the the whole industry of supplements and ideas about nutrition is is venturing on a lot of fantasy like that. Oh yeah, caffeine's great for you and maybe some other things in tea might have some beneficial effects in the right conditions for the right people with the right genetics and the right biome and the right combination. If we could oh, leave these other compounds out of the tea, if we could get, you know, like there's very complicated backflips needed to get away with this. But we were already upselling tea hundreds of years ago to make it very special. And, and back then, only the the elites could afford it. So it was the royalty of France and England and so on that were doing tea. Same with cacao and things like that. These sort of things that we adore for supposed nutrients. Phytonutrients is a misnomer because there's no they've never found any essential need for these quote phytonutrients. Essential foods or nutrients are haven't changed really since a hundred years ago that, that we need minerals. And we need these vitamins. Those are essential nutrients. These plant things is a whole more complicated idea. Uh, and we, what we haven't done is really understand all of the minerals and all of their beneficial effects and mm -hmm. all of their vitamins and really all the things they really do and, and how we can get them out of foods and benefit from them nutritionally or not. You know, so this is this. Patrician has really failed to dive deeply into those nutrients and failed to dive deeply into what we call bioavailability. You know, th I think this is a bit of a rabbit trail, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I, because it came up, you were talking about tea, Chimelia sinensis, <clears throat> which is, you know, one of those rich sources of xanthine molecules. So you've got, you know, caffeine, theobromine, theophylline, and wherever those occur anywhere in the world, like people find that, right? They're looking for... We're looking for drugs very often in our environments, you know, natural peoples, I'm saying. So so around the world, whether it's, you know, cacao or it's coffee in, you know, the Middle East or it's tea in China or it's yerba mate and, and wayusa in South America, it's uh, yopon here in the United States, like people find those and they ritualize them and they utilize them. And alcohol, the similar thing. One of the things I've always found interesting in nutrition, because you and I were just talking about energy from calories and we say there's lipids, protein, and carbohydrate, and we always leave alcohol out, which is, uh, as I understand it, seven calories per gram. So more energy in alcohol than there is, I mean, it's a dirty fuel, but there's more energy in it than carbohydrate and protein contain at four, uh, you know, calories a gram. So a little less than fats at nine calories a gram. So I always think it's weird because of the amount of alcohol that's consumed by modern people, yet we don't talk about it as an energy source. It's very odd. Like we just sort of brush over it. Or like what you're mentioning there, we talk about caffeine, but we don't often talk about any of the secondary metabolites that are in the plants that we get the caffeine from. And I always just find that really fascinating because it's almost like um, everybody wants to overlook certain things because we don't want to talk about how we use, we don't want to have like an honest conversation about how we use these drugs. Uh, right. nutritionally, you know, so it's just easier for everyone to sweep it under the rug. And, but what's crazy is you step outside your house and nearly every store you drive by sells some of these things. So it's like, how are we using them en mass and yet not discussing them at the nutritional level? Uh, it's just fascinating. Right. Well, and, and anything that's a drug is potential addictive powers and anything you can 
a dick the public too will make you money and what's in the stores is all about profit so you can see how we can easily get manipulated by <laughs> marketing and culture and start overusing what used to be ritualized food so in china when the uh, westerners were discovering china and discovering chinese tea uh, it, at that era the chinese used tea strictly for the entertainment ceremony so it was strictly for having guests over and doing a whole tea ceremony to demonstrate that you had uh, refinements in your cult, that you were culturally appropriate. You knew how to be a good host. You could entertain them with the tea ceremony. And the whole thing was about the ritual of I'm honoring you, my guest with my uh, sophistication mm -hmm. and look at my teapot because wow, I have a teapot. I mean, Benjamin Franklin complained when his wife or when they wasted money on one teacup. Who needed a teacup when you had this little soup bowl or you had your soup bowl or your stew bowl, you could do your tea out of your bowl. I mean, he talked about drinking bowls of tea because a Chinese China teacup is a huge extravagance. <laughs> right? Yeah. So these things are highly ritualized. Um, yeah, I, I had some interesting- Which means they're special. They're not day-to-day -day right. sustenance foods. And alcohol, you could, you could argue the same thing that, you know, in the Bible and so on, loaves, fishes, and oh, water to wine, you know, these are symbols of alchemy. We'll get back to the show in a moment. But first, right now I'm wearing my new wild-fed hoodie. We really took our time choosing these hoodie blanks before we had them printed. They've got a charcoal body and an olive green hood and sleeves. And they've got our Food is All Around You logo on the front with a really cool foraging basket, fishing rod, and suppressed rifle on the back with the text Hunt Forage Fish. These are super soft and comfortable, look great, and work well in the field or in town. I really love the thickness too. They're fairly light and perfect for the spring days and summer nights ahead. Right now, they're 10% off with the coupon code HFF10 at wild-fed.com. Show your love for Wild Fed and the wild food lifestyle. Head over to wild-fed.com and use the coupon code HFF10, that's shorthand for Hunt Forage Fish 10, for 10% off your new favorite hoodie. Now, back to the show. I've spent a lot of time trying to understand the origins of agriculture, um, you know, mm. impacted by, I think it was Jared Diamond who wrote, the article saying sort of like, hey, this is like the worst mistake humans ever made. Why did we do it? It's so much more work, so many more negative health impacts. It leads to stratification of society and, and hierarchical governance and all these things. So why would we leave this like leisurely egalitarian life with better health for, you know, the opposite? And I, you know, I've come to like two conclusions that make sense for me. One is uh, if you're trying to build you know, uh, citadels, like let's say like Gobekli Tepe and you need to feed the 500 slaves that you have working around the clock. Like maybe that's one reason you, you grow wheat, you make bread, you feed it to the, to the people you have laboring on this one idea. Uh, but the one I find even more compelling is like continuous access to alcohol. Cause as I understand it for most, uh, people pre-agriculturally, it's not like they didn't understand, uh, alcohol. They did, they would have, you know, they would make it and ritually consume it, but then it would be gone because whatever plant they were fermenting, whatever sugar source they were fermenting was pretty transient being seasonal. And so like, if you had access to grain all year, then you had access to beer all year. And that it could be just as simple as we just wanted to have beer or we just wanted to have wine consistently day to day, rather than like you were say, saying a moment ago, like it being something that was ritual and therefore not sort of like maybe daily. Well, like today. and also how could you have one in a day-to-day -day basis if you're a mobile culture? Mm -hmm. You need wine cellars. You need to <laughs> yeah. build these big vats that hold liquid. You need to There's walk a in a straight line. <laughs> you need to walk in a straight line. There's that too. And be able to shoot an arrow and get yeah. the right target, right? right like right. You can't be bombed all the time and hunt. And you can't be carting you know, you can think of like the beer keg, like think yeah. about the ancient beer keg, some kind of pottery, some kind of tortoise shells or whatever. You, can, you can't really drag around slopping around liquid all the time. Right, this isn't right. going to work. So and that's an argument for holding still so you can accumu accumulate. And somehow, you know, something was inspiring that. But, you know, the whole agriculture thing, as far as I know, I'm not, I, you know more about food and the uh, 
history of food than I do, because of course you don't get to learn these kinds of things if you go to nutrition school and public <laughs> Strange, health school. Strangely. <laughs> you don't get to learn about actual food, food production, cultural decisions about food. But I am aware that the adoption of sedentary agricultural based economies and cultures it was a very ragged affair that people would experiment with it and then it wouldn't work out so well. And so it was coming and going and coming and going on and off in different parts of the world and wasn't like, oh, let's all just hang around and eat corn on the cob. And <laughs> <laughs> let's eat Teo Sintle. Well, I have this question for you. So I, I'm, as I per- peruse your work, I, I get the impression you're very enmeshed into, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but, but it appears like you're, you're connected at a pretty deep level to the paleo, keto, carnivore side of the nutrition world. Um, and I'm curious, like your, how you, in particular, how you eat, or maybe, maybe not even how you eat, but like how, what kind of diets you promote. Cause I want to understand, uh, this idea of oxalates a little bit better. And I want to know, uh, kind of what, what in, is it, what, what's informing, what dietary practices are informed by you, your knowledge on oxalates or vice versa, you know, how, how all this has come together for you and like what side of the nutrition world you're really coming from? Well, like you, I have a deep history in vegetarian and veganism Oops. and adopted <laughs> vegetarianism as a young person and uh, did that for eight years. And then when John Robbins book came out, I adopted veganism because of course, all milk is pus and all egg yolks are going to kill you and are evil. If we could have seen uh, how he was going to age. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you look at him, you're like, dude, you need some oils in your life. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, sorry, back go. to the ice cream, man. Like yeah. <laughs> jump into dad's ice cream pool and put some cream in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he really, I mean, I, t- I took advice from Francis Moore LePay, who now admits that her whole thing was really political in nature. And she felt that if people got picky about their food and chose to eat this way, that they would feel politically empowered. <laughs> mm, wow. Which had nothing to do with being responsible about giving good advice for health, which is criminal in my view. And John Robbins and everyone else promoting veganism is choosing ideology over human well being. And I consider that criminal. And a, and an experiment that's never been conducted out. I mean, I, I'm always want to point out that there's never been a population of vegans that have reproduced and had a population of vegans anywhere in the world ever in history, whether pre-agriculturally or post-agriculturally. I mean, it just like doesn't exist. So this idea of going around and, and essentially, I would say like radically and militantly uh, mm-hmm. trying to trying to convince people to take on this diet en masse and even promoting it for the world when you haven't even worked out the experiment for two generations, it's like also criminal right. to me. Well, you know, the the push to limit animal foods comes in around the time, in my view, I'm, I, I want to study this more deeply, um, around the times when with enlightenment and philosophers who don't grind weed and don't <laughs> raise food. You know, these are the elites sitting on velvet pillows, writing books with quill pens saying, you know, writing, (laughs) you know, we need to get rid of kings and hierarchies in society because this hierarchy is suppressing the goodness of mankind and we need to be more fair. And when you take that argument all the way to the end, somehow it got warped into, so owning and, and husbanding animals is also bad because it's hierarchical. Uh And so there started to be more openness to not eating animals because it seemed it is a moral basis for living. Not eating animals seem to follow logically from this kind of velvet elite tower kind of thinking. And it got adopted in the moralism of Christianity in, in England. And a lot of English preachers came over the U S in an era when, most people were alcoholics and men were wife abusers and people were impoverished by an over, you know, use of resources toward alcohol. You can see your argument like alcohol could warp whole society and make us be agricultural instead of our, you know, mobile hunter gatherers. 
Same with our society was collapsing under the weight of alcoholism. And so this Christianity, this Bible thumping, like you should get closer to God. You shouldn't go to hell. If you, if you go to hell, if you sleep with other women, if you're violent with your wife, you're, this is not good. You don't go to hell. So you, you need to stop eating meat and eat this bran. Cause <laughs> it was also the idea of suppressing human sex. I mean, you look at, I'm sure, yes, are you familiar with Kellogg exactly right. and what he was trying yes. to do? I mean, this stuff's right. crazy, but, right? Exactly. That's like, don't sleep with children and don't even only sleep with your wife when you're trying to have ba babies, but let alone like don't sleep around. Like this is, don't masturbate. So this is where the seventh day Adventist really went off the deep end with it. <laughs> and like, if you touch your genitals, you will go to hell. <laughs> and we mustn't let children discover their genitals. We must have them, uh, you know, have certain ways of sleeping over with children, certain ways of raising children, so they don't learn to touch their genitals and don't learn masturbation. And that's this the, that's the origin of uh, our our modern form of circumcision was the idea that this would stop, you know, that you, you if you mutilated the penises of boys at at birth, they wouldn't, you know, because like I think a lot of people assume it comes from the ritualized circumcision of. Uh, the, like the Hebraic traditions, but it's like, it's not, it's, it comes from Kellogg and these guys promoting the idea of stopping masturbation. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Oh, interesting. I, I want to read some more about that too. Uh, it's really quite sad because Kellogg's goal was to be elite and be amongst the elite. He, he had adopt his children because he refused to have sex. With his own his... wife. He wouldn't have sex with his wife, if I understand it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, so how do you guy, have a good marriage like theory, that? <laughs> yeah, right. Because it's all about bonding. Like sexuality is about reinforcing yeah. the relationship and staying bonded and, and maintaining that, you know, strength and, and that fiber for a whole family unit. But his, you know, his style, I don't think his kids especially liked him either. <laughs> I don't no, think no. <laughs> he was a great family man, even though they adopted many children and, um, he was really focused on setting up an elite place where the elites came and like President Grant and all these fancy people came and he, you know, started feeding people these processed peanuts and processed grains and they invented the cornflake and basically the heart of processed food comes out of this fear of masturbation. And the <laughs> idea that meat would increase your, like, I think they were calling it like your animal desires and your primal drives, carnal you know? desires. Yeah, carnal desires. Same with the graham cracker. Graham, graham was uh, a competing force in this. So the graham cracker was- He was much earlier. He was more like in the 1850s. Okay. Um, and he grew out of this. There's a whole, there was a whole pack of them who got into bran in the 18, <laughs> mid 1800s and early 1800s. Like bran would, would- uh. Absolutely. You know, make you a better person, and and uh, you know, so even uh, Alcott was a doctor, and his brother, the, they were into the brand thing. Um, <laughs> it, it's just sad, you know. Like so, it's these really were elites who were saying you should eat this way, and Graham became the name of whole grain flour because whole grain flour wasn't particularly popular, but he helped to make it so. This is all, you know, early ideas about moralism connected to what you should eat. So we've been moralizing first to influence how we eat, and we're still doing that today. And I think this is a 400-year tradition, and now we've got to the point where with social media, these messages, and now with concerns over planetary health, that it, these these messages have been hard-pressed to get through. I mean, but we're struggling in the 1800s. Should I give up all animal foods entirely or not? This was a question that was um, among people who were literate and writing about food. This was a legitimate question a long time ago. But now with social media, we don't question. We're, we're ready to believe the story that humans can survive in a vegan diet. So, yeah. And as I mentioned, I mean, there's no evidence of it. That's what, that's the most shocking thing. There's no evidence right. of it, but I want to, I'm going to present this and feel free to push back against it. Um, I have teased Paul about this and my, all my friends doing the carnivore diets. Cause I'm always like, guys, this is a pendulum that's swinging. And because it's swaying all the way to, cause I look at, at, uh, food, my, all right, let me backtrack here. I like to say to people, what's food? Most people are like, well, I don't know. It's bananas and stuff. It's like, no, no, no. What is food? And it's like food is, <laughs> is the body parts of organisms. Occasionally, right. it's the secreted liquid tissues of organisms. But we eat, like your honey. plate is bodies and body parts. 
whether and they come from many kingdoms so it could be fungal body parts or animal body parts or plant body parts or algal in other words protist body parts but we eat the body parts from all these different kingdoms and there seems to be this thing of like well you should only eat from this kingdom or you should only eat from that kingdom and so when we got into this you should only eat you should never eat the, from the animal kingdom to me, it was like a matter of time before the pendulum swing, because that started to get very popular. Obviously, it's lost a lot of traction now, but but what has gained traction is the idea of going to the other end, which is like now you you eschew plants and you only eat animals. And I'm kind of like, hey guys, like uh, I got this radical idea. It's called the omnivore diet, and uh, it's based on anthropology. <laughs> so that's kind of my premise. Um, uh, it's not well, that I don't I mean, understand. Uh, I'll just finish this out, and I'll let you okay. jump in. I. I do understand that there are many plants that are toxic. Um, I also understand that there are many animals that are quite dangerous to apprehend <laughs> as well, and some are toxic. Uh, but uh, but by and large, I don't see anywhere in the world where humans, even in the most extreme climates, aren't omnivores. So that's um, I, I'll, I'll lay that out there, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so there's lots of different angles to this, and one of them is the folks that are pushing a full carnivore diet are all doing it because they're desperate for health relief from suffering. Right. Correct. In their personal experience, they've needed this diet in order to not be anxious, depressed, have eczema, have health problems, sure. and to feel really feel problems. good. Yeah. Agreed. Autoimmune problems. So you have to sympathize with this is a, uh, we've gotten to a point where our health is where people need stronger elimination diets. And for some people, a meat-based elimination diet is is uh, addressing their symptoms, and it's a better answer than being on pharmaceutical drugs. Agreed. So I'm all for that. It's a much better answer. We have to be, instead of wanting to impose principles of what did human beings eat over time, which is still a big guessing game, we have to look at today's reality, and people are really suffering. And that's where I'm at. I'm really concerned about the degree of suffering and ignorance that's leading to more suffering and that we're raising children in ways that are guaranteeing they're going to have autoimmune conditions, they're going to have chronic disease, they're going to have chronic pain conditions. That's where we're all heading. We're having early aging. We need nursing homes because we get so pathetic so early in life. So I think that's more a symptom of what's going on with the bigger picture with our well-being as a species, which mm -hmm. is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not about philosophical arguing. It's about they're trying to save their ass, <laughs> which I applaud. Yeah, and that's exactly where I'm at too. Is it know, does tend to I, lead I was though to apart. it does tend to lead to those philosophical things. So that's that's one issue that I have. I wish I heard more I'm messaging. Trying to generalize it, right? I wish I heard more messaging like, "Wow, because I had an autoimmune issue, I needed to do this, and so I want to promote this because there's other people that this might benefit." There, it tends to go to this is the natural way for people, and I'm talking about both sides. Like, so the the vegan and the vegan side does exactly the same thing. It's like a template that people follow. I I mean, I'm always like, hey, if you've got any kind of ism, it's time to like step back and take a look at it because this stuff's bad for our brains. I'm reading a book right now. It's called How uh, I think it's called How God How God Affects Your Brain. It's by a neuroscientist talking about studies on you know of of religion and spirituality on the brain from a very non non religious non denominational place. But one of the things they talk about is how how bad and toxic for your brain fundamentalism is, and it's right. like as soon as we get into this like. Because what I've noticed when you hang out with vegans, it's like you're in this special privileged group and the rest of the world are muggles. They're just outsiders who are living in <laughs> darkness. But it's the same when you're hanging out with the vegan and paleo people. It's, I mean, I just have the same experience. Uh, they're fitter and have, and they look better, but they have the same. Very often you get this. Now I'm not saying at an individual level it's like this, but the group think tends to go, we're right, everyone else is wrong. We know the secret that everyone has forgotten. Um, and I've seen that not just in those two worlds. I've seen that in a lot of different spaces. I've I've ha had the experience of walking in over the years. So that part really tribalism. concerns me. Yeah, it tribalism me and, as and, well. And okay. I am definitely not into that. I never take on a label. I don't never say, "Oh, I'm a Western pricer or I'm a this or that." My only label is that I defer to ancestral thinking. Yeah, that's here. my home base. Okay, so we're on the same Otherwise, page. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm interested in finding. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I I eat sugar, <laughs> I eat I eat rice. Um, you know, I, I help people figure out 
what's going to help them be well. And sometimes we really do need to go down to a fiber-free diet. And sometimes that's a beef-based diet. But it, some of us, right now we have a problem with alpha-gal and, and allergy to mammalian proteins. Oh my God, it's And terrifying. the kind of people I work with end up in that place too. Yeah. Uh, where they can't eat anything anymore because their immune system is so deranged. I uh, spend a lot of time in the outdoors. And so I, I would say an average day for me this time of year, I have to pick, you know, 10 ticks, let's say off me. Um, and, and my dogs and all of that. I mean, there's just, I, if I wanted to right now, I could go gather a half of half a liter of them in my backyard. <laughs> no problem. So uh, now luckily, uh, not a lot of Lone Star ticks, but I do encounter them when I travel. And that idea of an alpha gal allergy is absolutely terrifying to me. Um, so radically life altering. So yeah, I I, I really want to just say that I sympathize with those folks who for whom th these kind of diets become essential. Um, and I have tremendous respect for people that can discipline themselves to do it and then recover their health. So that said, um, that is not the same with the vegans. I mean, that's really the carnivores who are finding a medical solution there for them. It's a treatment. I would agree for with that. Yeah. I would agree but with that. the vegans are finding a way to do that elitist moralism. Like this is pure. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're clean. You're dirty. When I, uh, it, there's like a sin kind of a thing going on there. There's like a, you know, they, they, they almost conflate the vegan ideology with like the Genesis story. Um, interesting yeah. way, you know, but, um, I will say having done veganism and, and having taken it further and done fruitarianism, the early oh stages. Of, yeah. Glad I did you're it. still with us. <laughs> for, thank you. I did it for a lot of years, a, sh a shocking amount of years. Um, mm -hmm. when I did it. The initial phase was actually quite exhilarating. And uh, yes. I mean, I got to say like the detoxification was incredible. The weight loss was dramatic. I felt like I almost felt like I was floating on a cloud, uh, not just cognitively because that was one of the problems, but but like a lightness of being. It's just that it it doesn't last. And then by the time it starts to fall off, you've already committed to the religion of it. I think that's one of the scary things. So, But I would agree, right. the carnivore side is dealing with a little... And the other thing is when you... Um, when you look at folks on the side of the more paleo carnivore side, like I, I've been looking at a lot of your media this week, and uh, I have to say, you have a just an your physique, your health, your skin, your hair, you you look very healthy. So it's um it makes the things you're talking about compelling, because so many of the vegans you brought up John Robbins before, and I and I don't mean I hate to be so critical of an individual like this, but but man, I mean, he just doesn't. Well, when you set yourself up as a leader for whole movement, you set yourself up for a little bit of critiquing. Little critique. Well, he just looks like somebody who's who's starving from a lack of animal nutrients, you know. And it just, yeah. it, at least, you know, I haven't seen him in fifteen years. But when when I would see those images, it'd be like, whoa, wait a second. And if I think if we lined up long term vegans versus long term folks on the ancestral diet side, it's pretty obvious that uh Who's there's thriving. a failure to thrive on one side of that you know uh <laughs> that, and you know you and somebody could argue well all the people on that other side are weightlifting and they're doing it's like because they can because <laughs> they can do that you know they have the surplus of energy the ability well, to build muscle lack of protein in your diet yeah. it's going to be impossible to build muscle mass you need right. protein and so <laughs> sarcopenia is like cool now but it doesn't it's yeah. not good for your health Okay, so I want to. So say yeah, that so that fruitarian and veganism, just to put a bow on that, that you feel great on this plant base for a little while, and it's just like going on a fast at a meditation center. You know, you're just yep, yep. fasting, and that there's a certain sort of rejuvenation kind of response from the body, and it's nice to shed a little extra inflammation and weight, and even shed a few pounds of whatever weight. Um, there's a certain high to that, like, but you know, there's drugs for highs and there's fasting. You can do straight up fasting and be honest about it. Veganism right. is a pretend it's a diet when it's really more of a fast. I was into bodybuilding when I started doing it, uh, weightlifting with uh, oh, folks gosh. at a gym and I was a trainer at that gym and, uh, I was a pretty bulky dude. You know, I, I was 16, 17. So I was really anabolic at the time. My T levels are probably the highest they've ever been. And so I had a good amount of muscle <laughs> mass and I start this fruitarian diet. And, uh, I remember all the guys that I trained with being like, what are you doing? Like it, every day they'd see me like, what, what, what are you doing? Dude, stop this. You know, they're seeing me just 
emaciate down. And I'm like, this is, I'm like an anorexic person. Yeah. I'm looking in the mirror going, this is great. And I remember them just being like mortified about what happened to my body. Cause I went down to like, I'd say my, my, I'm right now about 180 pounds. I was 135 pounds. I mean, it's just scary for me to think Ooh. about that now, you know, but okay. So all that said, um, that's so interesting though, that other people can see this and the person practicing this practice can't well, what's the term they use now for um, when you think um, orthorexia? So the mm-hmm. idea that like you can eat your way to perfect health or like that, that some, you know what I mean? Like this obsession, like a, almost like anorexia, but it's an obsession with eating the perfect food. And I believe in that idea, except that everybody's idea of what that is is different. And, and hence, people can get into these really nasty neurological feedback loops where they just get stuck on in obsession with this is bad or this is good. I mean, I see, I just see well, that a lot and I see it taken too If you're malnourished, far. if you're malnourished, your brain doesn't work right. And <laughs> so you <laughs> yeah. become obsessive. But this anxiety yeah. and obsessive compulsive thing is a symptom of neuro in ill health, which can also be a product of not eating enough animal fats and right. proper nutrients and yeah. eating too many oxalates and plant anti-nutrients can cause a huge amount of neuro damage, neuroinflammation, uh, central, ne- central nervous system damage and promotes anxiety. I mean, there's a huge amount of my followers and clients, they get off the high oxalate foods and all of a sudden a lifetime of anxiety lifts. A certain calm comes into their life that they have never experienced. In looking at, okay, so I've been very skeptical of this idea of oxalates being this great danger. Uh, And then I started looking at your work and I was like, wow, okay, there's a lot here. I need to not judge this. I need to like take some time to absorb what you're saying. Um, I'm not- Which would be a rare attitude to have. Uh, Well, good one for a podcaster to have. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, all right, so a a little backstory. Like I have eaten uh, the plant Jack in the Pulpit, for instance. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but that is one (laughs) that will absolutely- So it's filled with those, are they called raffines? Those- um, Raphides, yeah. yeah. Raphides. Raphides. So uh, those are oxalate crystal bundles, right? And they- or something like that. I'll let you explain it better. But they, you know, one bite of this thing rips your throat apart. I mean, your mouth is burning, your throat is burning. It's a horrible experience. So I'm, I'm very aware that uh, those concentrated doses of oxalates have a, an incredibly uh, mechanically damaging effect. So it's not like I think, oh, oxalates, no impact. But where I get a little confused is that when I look at, as a forager, uh, so again, as somebody who's doing this experientially out on the landscape, because I think a lot of times when we're, we're, when I'm at these like conferences and people are talking about ancestral diets, I sometimes want to raise my hand and be like, have anybody here even hunted or foraged yet? Because otherwise, sometimes it feels like we're having very philosophical conversations about things we're not actually involved in. So as somebody who's involved in it, you become acutely aware over time that most of the wild plants out there are pretty oxalate rich. Many of them are. Um, So it's one thing to look at foods in our supermarket and say, uh, this one's good, this one's bad, but none of these are naturally occurring plants. I mean, almost nothing in our supermarket has been around longer than a few thousand years. Most of them haven't been around that long because we've essentially genetically modified them through domestication processes, through breeding. So... So I'm curious, like, do you think in the past people had a more ability to deal with the oxalates that they were consuming? Or do you think that this has always been a problem? Or is there some other exacerbating phenomena going on? Because if I was to go out and forage up a bunch of stuff and we brought it to the lab, I think the oxalate content would be pretty, pretty off the charts. And these are foods that have traditional use amongst the indigenous people of our region. And how many Jack in the Pulpits would you eat in a day, every day of the year? Zero. Because it wasn't eaten. <laughs> that was not eaten. Clearly. No, that wasn't eaten. But, but obviously- It's a great example. Like most wild plants are pretty toxic to the point where you know, oh, well, we can't eat that. Many. And we but try some, to remember some that. Aren't, some aren't, right? Like in a lot of them fruit and in, in their fruits that they produce are quite edible. Or, you know, I was just with the Lakota and the Dakota Sioux out on the Standing Rock Reservation harvesting prairie turnips. You can eat this thing raw right out of the ground, you know, big round tuber like a potato. Doesn't require any detoxifying. They typically do cook it, but that's it. So this is a food that people have been eating for a very long time. It's a traditional food. They can store it and eat it throughout the entire year, and they do. 
So it's like, it's not like, a, I, I, I don't think it's fair to say like, oh, all, all plants are toxic or most plants are toxic. It's like plants have, play a pretty critical role in a lot of, a lot of traditional diets around the world, uh, even amongst the Inuit where when they have access, they eat quite a lot of plants. So, so do you understand my question is like, have these, did people have a an increased ability to process oxalates or do, did they have because as you mentioned, many plants are toxic, but then indigenous peoples have developed techniques for uh, like remedial techniques and processing to reduce the toxic burden or detoxify the plant entirely. So did people know how to do that with oxalates? Because uh, it seems like that's difficult. Um, you know, when, how long have we been suffering from diseases that may be caused or exacerbated by oxalates? There's really lots of this gigantic question, set of giant pile of questions, and each has multiple facets. There, you know, there's so many different directions to to enter this in. And in in the modern world, your vulnerability to oxalate is about well, any world level of exposure, frequency of exposure, and the amount that gets into your bloodstream. So the amount that's getting into your bloodstream depends on how leaky your gut and how inflamed your gut is. Unfortunately, a lot of modern people have a lot of leaky gut mm -hmm. for lots of reasons. And instead of absorbing, say, 10% of the oxalic acid in that food, oh, you wow. could absorb 60 or 70%, which makes even a fairly low oxalate food very toxic in terms of oxalate. And the effects it has on the body are missed by us. We, we won't notice four hours later when the amount that's in your bloodstream is sort of peaking. You won't notice that you're having little hiccups or suddenly forgetting things or having a restless night's sleep or peeing a lot or having a little bit of burning pee or something. You just, you start to normalize that if that's going on. But for the most part, the body is doing everything it possibly can to uh, keep you upright and functional so that you're safe uh, out there in the wilds. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so it prioritizes the keeping the electrolytes right in your blood as much as it can and is busy doing things in the background you don't know about, busy packing things away and working hard on your behalf. And, and you're, ultimately, there's a cost in the long run. Um, and we think of things like not sleeping as well in old age, becoming arthritic, becoming forgetful, and nowadays developing Parkinson's and all these things is like, that's just what happens to humans. But a lot of what we think of is aging and lots of complaints that involve our connective tissues, our neurological function, and our digestive function can come right back to plant toxins where things like lectins and other plant toxins help to make sure we've got leaky gut if we're not using those traditional practices of soaking them for days and cooking the crap out of them. And really it takes the technology of like pressure cooking to really deal with the lectins, for example, which is how I ruined my gut being a, from a Cornell university degree in nutrition. And I knew nothing about lectins or any of this stuff and ruined my own digestive tract with undercooked, slow cooked beans. Um, but I was already clearly having oxalate problems earlier in life. And that just, um, I think, caused some L perma damage to the digestive tract. And so someone like that, who's done that, is never going to quite be who they could have been. But if, if we were uh, to go to Africa, though, like, let's say, and look at a, look at a Hadza person, like, I would, I would, I don't know, I would guess they eat a fairly high oxalate diet. I mean, they, you know, I, I haven't looked at the numbers or anything like that. But let's just say as an example, if we were to look at a modern day still foraging people, um, do you think that they have an increased ability to deal with this due to their native gut flora, let's say, or the lack of permeability in their gut? Right. Well, things like that? they have increased ability to deal with it because they're not eating processed oils. They're not living on processed foods. They're outside in the sunshine. They're not eating all the time. You know, they, they, they have days when they're not, their hunting isn't going so well and they have, you know, they have days where it goes really well. And so they're, they're living a, a very different lifestyle than we are here in the U S and in countries that have convenience stores everywhere. And there's just, we're just saturated with all kinds of the wrong foods. And we're often using these high oxalate foods in the supermarket, like the spinach and the almond, everything is the compensation for the guilt over all the junk food from the convenience <laughs> store. 
<laughs> it is push it through with something green. <laughs> I mean, you're raised on that. Oh, if you eat your broccoli, you can have your ice cream. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So, you know, there's a weird mixing of culture and behavior here that's really hard to um, fully tease out. And, and you're asking questions that don't have answers. What is true is that people who come to me who recognize they have this history of high oxalate eating and their symptoms line up with this oxalate toxicity problem and then mir miraculously heal from very serious health problems. And my only message is that it's possible that the food you think were making you healthy are the ones that have made you sick. You try this and a mirror, all kinds of things happen. So my point is, if you don't feel good, try this, see what happens, and uh, and we can support you in the side effects of what's happened and what's going to happen in the future now that your body's trying to unburden itself from a load of oxalate accumulation. And then the other big message is we have to stop ignoring the toxicity of oxalate and stop using any argument to justify eating high oxalate foods. There is no good justification. If you saw the kind of suffering that I see, you can't justify it with a philosophy. I'm more interested in being grounded in reality. And the reality is, is that oxalate poisoning is well documented to be a silent disease like so many other diseases. Like you don't know you have hypertension, high blood sugar. A lot of diseases, cancer, don't get discovered till you're like a month from death. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden she had a tumor and she died a month later. Like we know this. And that's certainly true with oxalate toxicity. You see it in the medical literature where someone who's very sick with oxalates isn't, isn't diagnosed with this problem until near death. So not having symptoms is no um, guarantee that you're not being affected by oxalate and that you're not losing your vision, losing your bone density, uh, losing your thinking or developing arthritis or developing old age symptoms that have been perking along underneath without any symptoms obvious to you. The mechanism, if, if I understand it, <clears throat> or, or yeah, as I understand it, it's like these crystals that are, that are, have, have like a very high hardness to them um, and quite a like mechanically sharp pokey bits to them. They're in plant tissues and then essentially they make it into the bloodstream and then no. again, okay, and then that's they, a that's a huge myth. Okay, please. You have to have major leaky gut to have whole crystals entering your uh, bloodstream. Do you does your the crystals are just the the out? one side of this? So oxalates are called oxalates plural because it comes in the oxalic acid, which is an ion. The oh, ion okay. can have either it's one molecular. or two positive charge. It's molecular and that comes along with crystals. So plants build crystals of particular shapes for particular reasons. The reason they build those toothpick, toothpick shapes, well, they have many other shapes they do, but the toothpicks are specifically designed as bows and arrows. Plants invented warfare with their quiver, quiverfuls, a sort of vacuole full of like 200 of these little microscopic toothpicks that can puncture your mucus, mucus membranes two cells deep. And that's why you get so much pain when you eat the jack in the pulp <laughs> because you're turning on your immune system. It's like, whoa, 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 we're being attacked. And the immune system is like, whoa, babe, and they're over here. And you get all this inflammation and pain. That's really your body responding to the damage. Um, but for the most part, those crystals that are more than rapides, there's druses and other so on. The crystals are just this sandpaper that's a aggressive, abusive to your mucosal tract, it can puncture or it can just cause electromagnetic disruption. And electromagnetic is very serious to a cell membrane. We don't have walls protecting our cells. We have just these little innocent cells with electromagnetic properties that make them work. And along comes these crystals and has electromagnetic damage to cells. So the the, the crystals are really just- Of the digestive really tract. Of the digestive, of the digestive tract. tract. Yep. It's the acid and some of the the acid conjugates with it bonds with calcium and other minerals like magnesium and iron. Any double the plus charged molecule. metal, I right. assume, right? Well, for the, but when it's a double ion situation, and it'll it comes in usually as a single um, the oxalic acid with a single negative charge, then it drops that hydrogen acid proton, and it becomes um, the perfect partner for calcium and these these. Um, divalent, positively charged minerals. So that molecule that's formed 
can also be absorbed as well as the ion. So you have the oxalic acid ion and you have the calcium oxalate molecule or the magnesium oxalate molecule. They whole cloth get absorbed by floating in the water that flows between the cells. It's called okay. paracellular transit. So that goes into your bloodstream. That blood, everything that you get that comes, we call that absorption. When food, when substances move from the food side of the intestinal tract into the blood side, that's absorption. You're absorbing oxalic acid, oxalic acid ions and calcium oxalate molecules and maybe even nanocrystals. Mm -hmm. Nanocrystals are so small, they can also do, and the more leaky your gut, the more these nanocrystals can get in. But the microcrystals that you can actually see in a microscope because they're bigger than the wavelength of light, they are just a sandpaper kind of roughage. That's a bad idea. (laughs) But what's really messing with your health is the acid. So you're absorbing the acid side and these small molecules and they start mucking with your electrolyte balance. But right away, this oxalic acid, a known toxin, your liver, sinusoids are flooded with everything you absorb, and it's requiring your liver to use a tremendous amount of glutathione to protect itself. And in the meantime, it can have uh, this acidifying property that starts breaking down the connective tissues. And there's connective tissues that is the scaffolding for tissues themselves. Like cells are basically embedded in connective tissues that both penetrate the cell itself and surround them and create a place for the cell to kind of hang out and know its place in the world. And you start breaking down these fibrils of connective tissue. And that's really serious. I mean, some people into the sort of electromagnetics of life talk about how electrons move around on these, on this network of connective tissue. And that's how the whole body knows itself because you get electricity kind of signaling and information instantaneously, it's much more quick than saying using vesicles at the end of a a nerve to cross a synapse, you know, like there's, there's a whole body wisdom that comes with electromagnetics of the body and oxalate is messing with the electromagnetics of cells and the structure of connective tissue. It's also, uh, it's, it fits on enzymes that you need to create blood sugar and the calcium, the the calcium oxalate molecules the, uh, the do ions. or just the pure the oxalate ions. ion? They sit there. Uh, they usually attribute the ion for doing this, whether a single molecule oh. that's already bonded with calcium does that or not. It could probably. I mean, it, it sort of looks like pyruvate to this to the enzyme and it sits there where pyruvate and the proper substrate should be and blocks the working of the enzyme. So you can create an anemia where the red blood cells start exploding if they have too much oxalate in them because yeah. the it's blocking the ability to, to do that last step in glycolysis so you don't have your ATPs and you need the ATP as a red blood cell in order to pump sodium out of the cell. There's this ATP sodium pump that breaks and the cells start swelling up with water mm-hmm. because they're fill, they're, the sodium is stuck inside the cell. Right. So, so you they have trouble making. In, they start pulling in water essentially until they, they start pop. pulling in water, and so the cells just split open. Okay. That's a type of anemia, and oxalate is a is a can be a big cause for that, and cause for problems making muscle glycogen and making glucose in the blood. And I find you know a lot of my clientele, myself included, there's a certain amount of broken metabolism we have from eating oxalates. Oxalate is suspected of uh, promoting diabetes and insulin resistance, but I definitely see this in my population where they can't go on a long-term ketogenic diet. They get leg cramps and fatigue and all kinds of problems because they're having trouble maintaining muscle glycogen and maintaining blood sugar levels because their metabolism is damaged. So, but it keeps going on, you know, like the oxalate will leave the liver and travel two inches through the, past the diaphragm into the heart. And and it's the same oxalic acid that just wrecked the liver because the liver can't do anything about oxalic. It doesn't have any way to conjugate it or disarm it or do anything with it. In fact, the liver makes oxalic acid and adds more to it. So you got your meal plus your metabolic oxalate, which is a very small amount and not a big deal. Um, but <laughs> after a big glass, it? who can excrete it? Just the kidneys? Just the kidneys, the skin, the saliva. Okay. The saliva okay. glands concentrate okay. oxalate kind so of. So it's water soluble, so it's going to come out in, in kidneys, saliva. Fluids. Yeah. Okay. But okay. the kidneys got 
the job to get rid of like 90% of it. Okay. Uh, some people are very good at colon excretion. And when the system gets acidic and the kidneys get stressed, that's a signal that turns on these transporters in the colon and the colon starts removing oxalate from the blood. Wow. The saliva glands just concentrate based on the level in the blood. So after your high oxalate meals, mine were usually sweet potatoes and Swiss chard, you, your levels go up in the blood for four to 10 hours. And during that time, the level of oxalate in your saliva goes up and you might be a heavy tartar producer. Uh, the eyes seem to excrete a lot of oxalate. It mm. could be that some of it, the through eyes the are kind of the, ducts or through the eyeball itself. All, well, it seems like it's all the eye ducts. There's many different kinds of ducts, you know, sebum ducts and tear ducts and this ducts. There's it's complicated tissue, but People, I still don't get this. My people, no, it's from the eyeball. Like, I don't know. Literally, like, no, they came out of the eye. So I haven't had that experience myself. And I've always taken my reports from my people with a great deal of skepticism. They've had to drag me into believing this stuff. <laughs> like, oh, my God, you <laughs> guys are getting people talk about the business. detoxification that they have. Right, saying, because yeah. when you stop eating it, the body starts shedding this. And I think one of my concerns about the eye excretion is that the eyes are the surface of the central nervous system. Right. Periscopes of the be, brain, kind of. Yeah. This may be the only exit route for all the junk that's collecting in your central oh, nervous system. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Now, they'll, yeah. they'll now, now calcium oxalate, when it's bonded, again, like you mentioned, calcium's a metal, essentially. I mean, I know we don't think about it like right. that, but, but when it bonds to a that- Soft, chalky metal. Yeah, soft, chalky metal. But it does have that, um, that positive charge, and it bonds to- Double. Okay. Yeah. Double charge like magnesium. And it, so, which also will do it bonds to this oxalic acid. Then that can precipitate out of the blood as crystals that can be essentially start to aggregate in your kidneys, right. And become kidney stones or do they, do they aggregate in other places and do, is it gravitational like gout? Will they start to settle in places? They, they are magnetically attracted to calcium. And the, once you get about six to eight pairs of these molecules together in one space, they suddenly whoop, nano, like this is the seed crystal that yeah. starts. And that precipitation okay. process is encouraged by vacular and other cellular debris. So you don't need a certain concentration. What you need is just a concentration of junk and it starts uh, crystallizing out. So it stops being this floating ion and acid right. and floating individual molecules starts crystallizing. And that, so anywhere where you've got inflammation, sigacin and dying cells, injury, infection, those are tissues that allow this precipitation to, to uh, occur. And anything that has a lot of blood flow and a lot of calcium, the oxalates end up hanging out there. Glands are another place that concentrate oxalate because they are what I call sweeper cells. They are factories that produce product. In order to produce product, you need a big shipping and receiving department. So you sweep in a <laughs> lot of materials. Well said. Right? So different reasons in different places in the body where they're going to collect. They're going to collect in places of high use, places of injury, infection, and so on. Places like your face that's loaded with calcium and loaded with vascular tissue. Your teeth have all kinds of capillaries in them. Your jaws, your sinuses, your eyes, heavy flow of blood flow. Um, so it ends up... What about your skeletal system? Where I know it's yeah, not that's a big calcium magnet. Resident. Okay, it is. No, so, it's yeah. a big, it's a, the pl- ultimate place where oxalate ends up is in your bones and bone marrow. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Because there's a, that's probably the deep, like, okay, let's get it out. Let's not, not have so much in your thyroid gland, darling. <laughs> but unfortunately, 85% of us have oxalate crystals in our thyroid gland by the time we're 50 years old. Wow. That is pathology. You may feel okay, but you're starting to get a little hypothyroid. You're not feeling great. Like, this has been going on for years where your body is collecting oxalate in the bones and bone marrow are really critical because you can look like you have normal bone density, but that hard as glass crystalline material that's collecting is giving you a false reading of okay bones or maybe even hyper dense bones. Often you see a mixed pattern in a bone density scan where one area is obviously osteopenic and another area looks normal or high. Uh, But bone marrow, I mean, think about it. Bone marrow is where Cells are born. Yeah, our Your immune, immune system, system comes is from. Born. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Immediately, and we have studies that show that just 40 minutes after a spinach smoothie, you have now these circulating monocytes in the bloodstream, which were born in the bones and got 
sent out is youngsters, you know, they're like 12 year olds in, in their development when they become circulating monocytes and they then get nailed again after your spinach smoothie and are putting out pro-inflammatory cytokines all over the body and they themselves are damaged and it is damaged immune cells that have to respond to your infectious agents and to deal with what's growing in your gut or not and everywhere else. Uh, so it's really hard, very toxic to the immune system. In the long run, it creates a chronic inflammatory. It's constantly aggravating the immune system, both because when you absorb the acid, it's directly harming the cells. And then when you form crystal deposits, this is like having asbestosis forming all throughout the body, chronic immune activation. And this is the thing. We have a huge problem with autoimmune diseases of like a million names for autoimmune diseases now where the immune system has gotten really dysfunctional because it's being overstimulated. And oxalate is the most common constant exposure that we have that creates an overstimulated immune system. You've already damaged your gut with plant toxins and then you've got this crystalline deposition disease. Your chances of being fully right and feeling awesome all the time go lower and less and less. And so you don't want to really wait until you have symptoms to be aware that (laughs) Building up to crystals in your thyroid gland and in your eyeballs is really not a great idea. All right. So if I, if I was going to zoom us way out big picture, because we just got zoomed in pretty tight. If I, if I was going to zoom us all the way out, um, I want to ask you this like big kind of macro picture question, which is the, the modern medical world seems to be at a bit of a loss for some of what's going on in our health and a lot of what's going on in our health. But in particular, there's we hear terms like metabolic syndrome. Whenever I hear syndrome, it's like, Hey, we don't know what it is. Uh, or, (laughs) or syndrome X I'll hear sometimes, or we're hearing now about all of these different autoimmune disorders, which is essentially like, we don't really know why the body's freaking out kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, and, and there's so many factors, right. And there's people who are going to say it's this, this, or it's this, you know, like, is it the, is it the gazillion new chemicals we've released into the environment? Is it the departure from sunlight? Is it, there's all these factors, right? These variables. But from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like, like what you're saying is that underlying most of these metabolic immune compromised kind of, even, even things like I'm guessing things like fibromyalgia, which is another one of those things. It's like, Hey, your, your connective tissue is breaking down. We don't know why or whatever. And you're, you're hurting. Uh, are you saying that oxalates or your opinion is that oxalates are what's underlying a lot of these sort of not well understood phenomena that we're seeing today in people's health? Based on all the research I've done, you could easily say that. Wow. Tell me about the Uh, foods that are are culprits because, um, (laughs) yeah, so this in the leafy green department, there's only four plus all those exotic ones that people like you play with. Uh, But there's sorrel, there's chard and beet greens, which is basically the same Same, plant. Same plant, yeah. Exactly the same. One makes the beet, one doesn't. It's called silver beet, the chard. But the red chard is is really high like like beets greens are. And then there's spinach. And that's basically it. Like, okay, beet greens, chard, spinach, and sorrel. All the other greens, we've, you know, the lettuces, the all of them. Purslane's a little on the high side. Um, but, you know, even dandelion greens, it's higher than lettuce and so on, but it's not nearly in the same league as those four. Nuts are universally protected by plants with oxalate. The plants seem to need oxalic acid for the germination process later, and they also create a nice hard surface on the surface of a seed. Mm. I've seen this cross-section of the raspberry seed. There's this perfect ring of little tiny oxalate blocks helping to create a hard outer crust underneath the hull. And then the plant uses that calcium oxalate to generate the calcium, which is a cofactor for making amino acids and growing in the next raspberry plant. Uh, So nuts are really high. Almonds, cashews, peanuts, pine nuts, those are the worst ones. And almonds have many other toxins in them. I consider them the most toxic food that we that we accept as a superfood and healthy for us, but it's probably the most toxic. There's uh, turmeric and certain spices are quite high in oxalate, turmeric being the most obvious one. It's so weird because we we think of it as anti-inflammatory, but it sounds like it's pretty inflammatory if this is the case. It's pretty inflammatory, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a whole another topic, by the way, this idea of anti inflammatory phytonutrients. That's a that's a deliciously weird, ironic silliness. That's fun to talk about, but maybe takes more time than we have today. Um, so the other foods include many of the beans, the black beans, pinto beans, the white beans we use to make Boston baked beans. Those are really high in oxalate. Uh, and then let's see, there's some fruits. Star fruit is known for killing people. <laughs> it's fruit and it's juice. <laughs> Wow. Uh, <laughs> raspberry, dark black raspberries are pretty bad. Clementines and tangelos can be pretty high. The nice thing about the fruits, though, is they're mostly the crystals. So it's mostly that sandpaper, electromagnetic abrasion. Versus the acid, of the acid ions. Okay. Right. Okay. So with eating a lot of fruits, I think you get more gut irritation than you get maybe chronic buildup in the body. But once you've irritated the gut, you've got more chance or maybe some of those crystals do get lodged in the digestive tract. It's really hard to study the digestive tract of human beings. We sure, have to do it with rats and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, so yeah. let's say you and I are walking in my backyard. It's, it's actually the raspberry season just begun because I ate a couple yesterday. So first thing is, uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. One is, uh, I would imagine that the bulk of the seeds in a raspberry are going to go through my digestive tract unbroken and undigested. Uh, That's and the, second, the design. Okay. And they're so, supposed to do that. So, they're designed yeah, right. to be indigestible. Right. So that fruity flesh is not, not a concern, I assume. It's the seeds itself you're saying. Well, we don't really know. And all of these ideas end up not really proving themselves 100% true in all cases. So jumping to these principles like, oh, as long as you remove the seeds, um, removing the seeds is a big help. But you know, if the seed is completely indigestible and the hull on that seed is keeping you from being exposed to the crystals, you know, maybe that's not so bad. The problem is, is that in real life, people who are now uh, aware of the oxalate affecting them, they can tell when they've been eating something high oxalate or not, even if it's something that right. seems to be mostly insoluble. So we don't really know how much the stomach acid, for example, is... Uh, liberating oxalate. And there's no one answer because everybody's ability to make stomach acid at any particular moment is variable within that person, let alone right. from person to person. Yeah, that's a good point so too. It's really hard to like, oh, you're fine if you just eat. And the thing is that jellies and jams made from these berries are often not so bad. you know. So if you're just eating a tablespoon on spread on something or mixed on your ice cream, it's not a big deal. It really is about dose. But the problem is we're concentrating the dose by doing things like smoothies every day and using keto bread and with the almond flour. And just like me, I love my sweet potatoes. I made them my staple after I left the vegan world. I left being a vegan because I knew I was now reacting so badly to bread and grain, wheat and also beans. So what was I going to eat? I couldn't eat beans and wheat anymore. They were like my backbones of my diet. So I adopted sweet potatoes as the alternative and I started eating them like you would eat bread on a day-to-day -day basis. That was a bad idea. And I didn't notice when I made that change that I was now getting, uh, well, I did notice I got crow's feet around my eyes within six months of switching to sweet potatoes. I also got rhomboid pains that were so bad at night I could not fall asleep without begging anybody nearby to rub on these knots in my back. And within a couple of years of that, I developed these little tiny brown flecks on my skin all over. And I went to a dermatologist because I also, this little thing on top of my head was irritating me so much like I couldn't style my hair. And I don't even use a comb, I have curly hair, but it was really getting irritating. So I went to a dermatologist to cut that off, which is probably a reaction to the high oxalate sweet potatoes, et cetera, that I was now adopting, I went from a too high an oxalate diet to even higher oxalate diet trying to fix the problems that that vegan diet and the oxalates were causing. And I said, what are these little brown dots? And he laughed at me. He goes, those are age spots. Now, I'm like a 35-year-old woman. I'm not interested to hear that I'm developing <laughs> age spots. Right. So that was very distressing and, and felt dismissive and also felt scary that here I'm getting these crow's feeds, these, this, this pain, this sleeplessness, and these spots. Never, never in my life would I have blamed sweet potatoes were my savior. They were the low, ox, mm -hmm. the low uh, not low oxalate, but low allergen food where you can have as much sweet potato because it's not causing – what was clear to me is I was now overreacting to foods, and sweet potato was my safe harbor for that completely diluted. So 
if if you, my second question from earlier, if you and I are walking past the raspberry patch, like I'm, it's irresistible to me. You're not going to eat that. How many can you hold in your palm? How long are you going to stand in the hot sand? A lot of times it's on a, by a roadside where you're seeing them in the summer, the hot sand is standing there. You don't usually come with like a whole wheelbarrow to fill up on raspberries. You, you eat, you know, 15 of them and then you move on. You're heading for a watering hole. You're heading for some other activity usually when you happen upon raspberries. Uh, I don't know about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that you, one linger. Cause you're a forager, but the rest right, of but, us, but humans you know, are like, foragers, right? Like that's the thing. Growing like, up, we're human. Humans are foragers, you know? So, so typically yeah, like, head. like a human being is going to create a container and then they're going to gather quite a few of those and they're going to gather enough for significant amount of drying and storage, pounding, turning into leathers, turning into, you know, pastes, that kind of thing. Right. So, so traditionally, I'm saying like these, you know, foods, these foods get consumed in mass uh, when they're abundant. By a whole community, usually, because yeah. it takes yeah. a lot of people to do of all that. Food is always a communal thing. And right. today, people who choose hunting, gathering lifestyle usually have to do it as like this lone wolf. <laughs> it's completely it's, it's so You can't do it. How can you do all that hunting, dressing, processing, storing and cooking and preparation by yourself? Yeah, you have it's, to get a TV show and get paid to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. You can't <laughs> make it a lifestyle. You need to do nothing else, and you wouldn't have any friends except for when you did the barbecue moment. <laughs> Unless they're for as long as the beer is free, right? Uh, chia seed is one I've heard you talk about. It's like one of my favorite mm. foods. I, I'm, I'm so mm. like, bummed to hear that, but could you touch on that one? I'm bummed to hear that you're eating chia seeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, really depending on chia depending seeds. on how all this lands for me, I may not be anymore. But that's been one that I've really liked. Well, that would be good. I would consider that a, the reason for us to speak today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, chia seed is chia seed is pretty bad. When the seeds, it's probably one of the worst seeds. Yeah, yeah. And people are tempted to eat it like it's oatmeal or something and do it on a routine basis. And I mean, I'm kind of daily. It goes into my smoothie, you know. So. I yeah, soak it and it, yeah. it goes into my smoothie as like a, one of the, like a thickening agent, you know? Yeah, it, it does gels up beautifully. It's got all kinds of soluble something or others gelling up and doing cool transformations. It's like bubble tea or something. It's fun. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's doing the oxalate thing. Um, any other foods that are big culprits? And obviously, um, I want to send people to your web media so that they can see your lists. But um, any others that really stand yeah, out? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'll be coming out with a really well-vetted list this year. It's taken years to write a database and vetting the data. Handling data is very difficult to do well. Most of the lists online are loaded with mistakes and are too short and are inaccurate, and this is a big mess. Um, so soon, uh, we'll have as good a data as we can get from the literature with several thousand items on there. And, oh, and, that's great. And me trying to arbitrate, because what we've got 16 tests of spinach, so which number do you use if you're trying to estimate how much oxalate you're eating? I'm going to suggest here's a happy medium with a nice rounded number so you can use it to do some back of the envelope calculations and not just have your eyes roll in the back of your head like, oh my God, spinach is somewhere between this much. Like, you know, even having to absorb 15 different numbers. So what I'm trying to do with this data is make it usable, which takes a tremendous amount of time, like just to think about oatmeal and how variable it is and how we don't have enough data to know like what's the most likely number because it's very so darn much what do we do you know so hopefully this tool will help people make sense of out of it somewhat yeah i think i mentioned recently uh on another podcast that i was going to have you on and i'd be talking to you about this and i got um an email from a listener uh, maya leah and she she was saying uh so shout out to you maya thanks for writing she said um you know, she described some of the health issues she has had from oxalates, but she was describing the frustrations in trying to find a reliable database. She's like, it's just the numbers are all over the place. And the other thing she wanted me to ask you about, um, which I think you just answered about, is there a reliable database today that you would send somebody to until yours is out or, or is it kind of hit or miss right now as far as like what well, you're Well, the Volva Pain, the Volva Pound Foundation is the reason we know how to do a low oxalate diet because- it became clear to them, she's been doing this for over 26 years. And within like the first five years, she realized we don't have enough data. We need to test more foods. So she's been devoted to testing foods for 20 years. And she's been putting this data out in her newsletters like 20, 
40, 50 items at a time, and it's kind of scattered all over. It's a little difficult to use. And even there, you'll find mistakes. I found a mistake recently. I had taken her number that an ounce of sweet potato chips has about 47 milligrams of oxalate. And then in my database, it says it's 60 because my database puts it in in how much per 100 milligrams. Well, the mistake she had made to say it was 47 was that the one ounce, which weighs 28 grams, is equivalent to 17 potato chips. So you, she accidentally used the 17 to calculate ah. how many oxalates per ounce. So she's, she calculated as if one ounce weighed 17 grams instead of 28 grams. So she got she published a wrong number for how much you get in that tiny one ounce portion. So it's, that's just an example of how freaking easy it is to make a mistake with data. And the mistakes, the levels of mistakes are all over. And that's layering on top of the fact that foods are naturally variable and they're going to vary a lot anyway. And the testing is a little uneven and it's really a big mess. But so the people who've taken her data and they've put it into a spreadsheet rather than a database. So in my database, we can catch these things and we can go back and double check and make sure we've entered the numbers correctly. But the folks who've tried to put it in a usable spreadsheet is the Trying Low Oxalate Group, which has been around... I don't know, 18 years or so already, maybe. Um, and that spreadsheet has a lot of data entry errors. And I've found at least 20 to 30 errors in it. So, But it's better than your average. And so my lists are, that are coming out, hopefully, will be a little better than that with no promises of perfection. <laughs> what about the other question she asked was about um, soluble versus insoluble oxalates. And uh, I'm not really hip to that. So I'm wondering if you could explain that and answer her question. Does she need to be worried about insoluble uh, oxalates? Right. So we we skidded on that ever so lightly earlier when I was explaining that oxalates come in multiple forms. So we call them oxalates plural Mm -hmm. in that the ion can either be a single or a or a double um, negative charge. So the things that are hooking up to that single, the potassium, sodium, lithium, that's a soluble oxalate because it easily, when you put that in the water of your saliva or the food or your stomach, it easily breaks apart into ions. But calcium, magnesium, iron, who who grab both of the negative charges, that marriage is stronger and the strongest bond is the calcium. So usually when we're saying insoluble oxalates, we're talking about calcium Calcium oxalate. oxalate. Okay. And calcium oxalate and crystals. So the crystals, the bigger the crystals, the less it is easy to dissolve the thing. It takes stomach acid. It takes special proteases and acids from cells to break those up. So the bigger the crystal, the more insoluble it is. Okay, so so I'm eating chia seeds daily in my smoothie and then, you know, serial killer eats me. And I'm loaded with calcium oxalate. Does, does serial killer kind of, you know, who's, who's, uh, cannibalizing me, do they absorb that or do they mostly absorb the ionic form from, from consuming me? I know that's a creepy thing to ask, but I'm trying to get a sense of this to, to answer that question better. You might have to re-ask that question because I'm not fully understanding the okay. heart of the question. So in my body is going to be lots of calcium oxalate, right? Because I've been eating, let's say I've been eating chia seeds daily, right. like I mentioned. Right. So I'm probably mm-hmm. forming this um, insoluble form, this calcium oxalates. So if exactly. something, <clears throat> if somebody consumed meat, my body, which is full of calcium oxalates, would they absorb those calcium oxalates or would that stuff largely pass through them unabsorbed, maybe doing some mechanical damage to the gut, but not being absorbed directly the way that in the ionic form right. would be or the soluble form would be? Right. The body doesn't leave a lot of ionic oxalate hanging around in the body fluid. So it would be mostly in the urine where you see that soluble oxalate and not in the tissues. So you'd have to be a urine drinking man eater. <laughs> well, now we're getting real weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to foods. Just want to make sure I give you room for Are there any other foods that are big culprits that you want to make sure get mentioned today? Um, I get such a similar response on my teeth when I eat an unripe banana that I do with spinach. Is, is mm. banana a source or is that some other phenomenon that's banana happening? Banana is fascinating because we've only tested it a few times and we don't know what we're talking about with banana because... It seems like, except for one test, the five that are out there, or three or that are out there, suggest that a medium banana might have 10 milligrams of oxalate, which is reasonable. 
or maybe even less than that. But the interesting thing is that the banana tree sap was traditionally used in hunting in certain ancient cultures where they would take their probably wooden uh, point of their sphere and put it in the banana tree uh, you know, trunk overnight. And the banana tree trunk, the sap, is so full of oxalic acid that they've now laced this arrow with oxalic acid so that even if they're a bad shot, the oxalic acid will paralyze the animal so they can catch that animal that they've heavily wounded uh, because the oxalic acid sort of guarantees a kill. And the banana peel is probably in an unripe banana. The banana peel and unripe banana, I'm guessing, is pretty high. They, one group in Southeast Asia somewhere used banana peels from the marketplace to try to create another income for banana growers and dried the banana peels in order to use it to clean heavy metals out of water. So you could wow. use the oxalic acid in the peel as a biosorbent that would chelate these heavy metals from toxic water. So clearly there's enough oxalic acid in a banana peel and to tree. chelate heavy metals <laughs> in water. So right. There's something going on with bananas where we don't, we haven't studied them enough, okay. but I have a feeling the riper it is and make sure you don't eat the skin. It's okay. Okay, well, that's uh, but I wouldn't yeah. eat tons of them because right. it may be some variability that we haven't caught because there's so limited testing. We need to test bananas from all over the world, different times of the year, different ripenesses, different handling practices, to really get a sense for what's the variability and what might be the factors behind it. <sighs> this is really hard. So to we hear don't know what we're this, talking about. All this information. I'm aside, sorry. It's hard to hear. I. As I told you before we got on air, I, I came into this feeling a little defensive and even, uh, you know, I was talking to my wife this morning. I was like, man, this, this information makes me feel a little combative, but I, I really want to hear it, you know, because there's nothing like the, for me, there's nothing like the ecstasy of finding out something that I've cherished to be true is not true. It's like something really? about that. Yeah. I love the, yeah. I mean, the revelation of like, because it opens up a whole nother world. So it's like, wow, this could really shift something for me. I'm going to need to sit with this and and do my research and start to really examine the foods that I'm eating because there's some, some of these major culprits are in my diet. And, um, you know, for me personally, just to be vulnerable about it, one of the things that really caught my attention was your conversation about connective tissue. Um, I got a body work background and, and pretty good understanding of how the myofascial system works and and uh, I'm really prone to connective tissue injuries when I'm training. And uh, and sometimes I'm like, what is going on with me? I mean, you know, I, I take great care of myself. I eat really good. Why do I keep injuring my connective tissue? Um, and so I'm starting to wonder as we have this conversation, like, wait a second, is this self-inflicted through like a auto, you know, poisoning of with, with oxalates? Um, so I just this want you to know. This is a great insight. Uh, this you, is a go ahead. perfect insight because this connective tissue instability is one of the early signs of the oxalate problem. And uh, it can become very debilitating because we want to be active and be free to do whatever we want. And this can really get in the way of the life you want. So it's so, so exciting for people to be able to hear and, and see and recognize. It's, it's um, Wow. I mean, it means everything to me. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I have two, two other questions. Um, one is, I'm going to ask them both and then we can pick them apart separately. But my, my, the first question is like, um, is there a, what is the daily threshold that you would recommend? Because um, oxalate consumption must vary, you know, tremendously person to person, day to day, moment to moment. So what what is like a safe amount? And then is there a way for a person like myself who's in the food world and in the nutritional supplement business, is there a way for me to test foods uh, reliably so that if I'm, I'm thinking of, of products that I you know have in the pipeline to launch over the years, like how do I find out what their oxalate content is? Oh, this is music to my ears. I'm hoping one of the outcroppings of my work is that we start seeing oxalate as something that needs to be on labels and needs to be revealed to the consumer because mm. how would you know as a consumer, you have no information about it. So testing foods would be great. Uh, it's that's We'll have to talk offline about what are the possible ways to get tested because it's pretty vague. It's A lot of people in academia are not interested in doing the testing because you can't build a tenure track career on it anymore. There's mm. been some of it done. We've figured out how to do it. So that's all that matters anymore at this stage of 
the attitude in academia. And the man who was doing the testing for the Volver Pain Foundation retired about a year and a half, two years ago. I think he still has access to labs and some graduate students can be convinced to do testing for money. So there's ways to do it and there's companies that do testing food and so on. But that that's a whole area where we're under-resourced as a nutritional community for really knowing the oxalate that's in these foods and food products. What was your other question? Uh, the other question is like, what is the daily value that you'd say oh, is okay. safe? Because I, it's not like you could avoid consuming unless you ate a completely right. carnivore diet and uh, it would be very difficult to right. avoid completely. So how much can we eat? And how, yeah, what, so this what, what do we, how do we even question. quantify it? Like, what is the, yeah. what, is, what value do we put on? Is it in grams? Is it milligrams? Like, how do we think about it? Yeah, it's a milligram scale for how much oxalate it's in milligrams. And uh, for the last 50 or so years, only funding into oxalate research has been really for kidney stone research because oxalate is the main ingredient in the kidney stone. And there's, it's obvious that oxalate causes a lot of the modern kidney disease problems. So the, that research from that literature suggests that A, normal levels of intake, believe it or not, are 150 to 200, 250. So we can call it 200, but 150 might be more accurate. That's what is, quote, normal level of intake. And that the kidneys are designed to handle about 25 milligrams of oxalate a day. And about 12 of them come from endogenous production from the liver and some other cells in the body. So you get to have like 13 milligrams of oxalate in your kidneys and urine every day and at 10% absorption that translates to 130. But we can round that up and call it 150 or even 200. So if we're being generous, we say 200 is not only normal, it's what you can handle. You're designed to handle some degree of oxalate because yes, historically we've always handled oxalate in foods and Oxalate is ubiquitous. It's in the acid rain. It's in the soil. It's everywhere in nature. It's in the oceans. The the mist of the ocean edge uh, creates oxalate. <laughs> it's it's in some of the traces in fish. There's even a toxic snail that's loaded with oxalate. Uh, so that level of about 150 or 200 is easy to exceed, given that a large iced tea has about 50. A uh, big handful of raspberries is about probably 50. <laughs> wow, okay. Ah, yeah, so three big handfuls of raspberries, you're covered for the day. You're good. Stop. And and how much is happening in a single meal versus spread out makes a big difference too. How much you, if you're on fasting, if you're overnight fasting, you're going to absorb a little more. Um, it, your How leaky your gut is, it's going to make a difference in how much you can tolerate. And, and if you're now clearing oxalate because you've removed oxalates from your diet, primarily, mostly, it, like the carn, this is why carnivore is so connected to me. Okay, this explains my connection with the carnivore world, is that once you go carnivore, you've put yourself on a zero oxalate diet, usually having just departed from a high oxalate diet because you were doing keto bread and paleo this and so on. Because uh, the paleo diet's loaded with dark chocolate, which is another food I forgot to mention earlier that the no! cacao, yes, is very bioavailable. And we have quite a few research studies using chocolate because it's pretty easy to convince volunteers to take a small stipend to eat some chocolate and give some pee, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we know it's very bioavailable, gets into the blood quite rapidly and is a pretty terrible form of oxalate. So the darker the chocolate, the more oxalate. So, um uh, it doesn't take but, you know, barely two ounces of chocolate where you're, you've got a pretty toxic dose that can increase the amount of oxalates in your urine by 250 or 230% or something. That's considered toxic wow. level for the moment. Do what these about, momentary floods of toxic well, coming after these foods. Coffee? Coffee is almost no oxalate, like maybe two milligrams. <laughs> My wife's very happy to hear that. <laughs> so am I, because somebody would have bumped me off by now. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you can't mess with the sacred cow. Um, all right, so so 150 to 200 milligrams would be like a, a, a reasonable amount daily. For what, a daily. What, what's yeah. like, what do you, have you, I'm sure you've thought about it. What do you think the average American is actually consuming um, in milligrams daily? Probably between 600 and 1,000. Wow. Okay. One spinach smoothie done, you know, kind of big style spinach smoothie with a couple tablespoons of almond butter, peanut butter, and a couple cups of spinach, you're, you're at 1,000. 
milligrams. Whew, man, I'm not putting spinach in my smoothie, but I'm putting a lot of chia oh, seeds good. in there. So I'm sure I'm, I'm getting up there. Uh, all right, Sally, this has been really fascinating. I, um, I'm definitely going back to the, the research on this one and I'm going to start picking this apart. So, uh, you've, you've impacted me here and hopefully some of the folks listening, is there anything that we didn't talk about, uh, that, um, I told you an hour, we're at an hour and 40. So thank you for your generous time here today. Is there anything we didn't talk about that, uh, you'd like a little space to cover? Switching to a zero oxalate diet rapidly can be dangerous. The body reads what's going on. And, and my simple take on it is it's like moving from raspberry season to winter too fast. And usually I consider my, that's my sort of bookmark for saying certain times of year, plant foods become pretty scarce. And that traditionally it's pretty uh, logical to imagine a few months, January and February, where you're living primarily on hunting and fishing and stuff like that. Certainly here in the colonies, it was like ham and white biscuits all winter. And so winter time, you would get rid of the raspberries and the two weeks of spinach and, and that seasonal stuff that had been building up in your system. And that amount of detox for one year's accumulation is pretty doable. But doing a 20-year detox in one fell swoop can be pretty toxic. The body can sometimes just go, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for winter for years. And it starts just sort of upchucking oxalate from tissues in a way that's dangerously toxic. You can end up in the emergency room with AFib, arrhythmias, hypertension, and feel like you're dying. So it's good to just like, okay, spinach, chia, kind of like one at a time, start pruning these down and take your time and, and be a looking for signs like very cloudy urine can be the crystals kind of causing a little bit of haziness in the urine that's called crystallaria sometimes you get crystals coming out of the stools or the grit in the eye gets real heavy or your tartar gets heavy on your teeth you may be seeing these signs the body is starting to shed oxalate and what this means is the level of oxalate in your bloodstream and in your urine and in your kidneys is going up after you stop eating them your body's mobilizing it out of storage back into exactly. the bloodstream and then to the organs of elimination, like the skin, like these ducts we're talking about, like the kidneys. So it's got to go to all those places on its way out of the body. Exactly. Which is pretty toxic and promotes more and more this immune irritation and can keep autoimmune diseases a little bit, a little bit vulnerable to, to continuing them or having more food reactivity or some other issues. But Generally, we see people suddenly they can sleep, their anxiety is gone, their autoimmune diseases are receding, their energy is coming back. It, it's quite, um, that's what makes it so concrete. Wow. All right. So go slow uh, because the, there's a significant detoxification process that's going to happen. Right. And it could take 10 years. <laughs> How comforting. Uh <laughs> well, that's a good thing. What the yeah. comfort in that is that that's your body being wise enough that it knows if it dumped it all out in the first year, you wouldn't be around anymore. You would definitely lose your kidneys and you'd probably have either a stroke or a heart attack if it unloaded it all at the same time. Wow. Okay. Where do we send people to follow up? Um, your website's got quite a bit of information. Um, I, I was reading, there's like several uh, like short kind of concise little articles that I was reading that kind of walk you through some of this. So um, you know, you guide us where, where you want to send people to follow up and to, to get more of your work. Um, you also have a great yeah. compendium of interviews you've done on your website as well. Well, and there's many more than I have time to put on my, on my, uh, page. I'm, hopefully I'm gaining some more time. I've been struggling with the polishing of the manuscript and mostly it's been the data that's been sucking up all my time. Like re discovering that potato chip error was part of polishing the manuscript. Like, oh, okay. I had made this graph years ago that it turns out I'm wrong on the graph. So the um, I'll fix this, but there's probably maybe 70 interviews of me talking about oxalate and people do find them uh, helpful. Um, my website is loaded with free information. There's a support area where you can sign up for a group class and you can see more information and meet other people who are suffering with oxalate toxicity and kind of get feel like you're in a community. Uh, there, you can buy a cookbook of low oxalate vegetables, what the heck to do with a turnip and 
have it seem like normal American food. Uh, so there's resources there. There'll be more coming. And I'm on Instagram. I have two accounts now on Instagram. There's SK Norton, which is my original account. And then I created a new one in March when SK Norton got hacked called Toxic Superfoods underscore oxalate underscore book. And so that'll have more information from or about my forthcoming book, which is called Toxic Superfoods. Uh -huh. So if you reach out to us through the website, through our contact list, or get on my email um, list, I'm I'm a one person shop, you know, so, and I don't love MailChimp, so I'm pretty terrible <laughs> about sending out emails. <laughs> But I want to get better at that. But that's a good place to be. So if I get hacked again or something happens, I actually can tell you, hey, get me on Instagram because I've been stolen again. Hopefully that will never happen. But that experience made me realize, please, people, if you want to be in touch with what's coming up the pike with me, then get on my email list. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I'll be following up with you at some point because... Um... I've got a, I've got a lot of fine, uh, like I got to take a fine tooth comb to everything and, and start to get these numbers, start to get a sense of what I'm consuming here and, uh, and experiment a little bit. So thanks so much, uh, for this and uh, all the work you're doing. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.